Turn your Bible, if you would, to Matthew, excuse me, Genesis chapter 17. I'll read just a little bit, and then we're going to use, I don't like to use Scripture as a springboard, but that's what I'm going to do tonight as we look at the character of Sarah in the passage. But let me say a word while you're looking. I want to say bless you to the people here at Central Church. I love your preacher. He is a good man, and he's a man of God. He's been an encourager to me. I need a dose of Brother Jordan about every couple of weeks. And if he's wondering why I see him, truth is I'm stalking him, and I'm trying to just get around him a little bit. And let me say uh, with all seriousness, my tendency, the Bible says truth and grace, uh, kindness and uh, mercy and judgment. Well, I'll be honest with you. I tend to be overdosed on the judgment side. And I just need to get around somebody that balances me out. And your preacher does that. He's a loving, godly man. And he's made a good mark on this town. And your church has made a good mark on this town. Somebody say amen, amen, would you? There you go. It's so good to see you. Good to know a number of my friends across here. And if I look to the left, if I get nervous, I'm going to look to the left. Because this is a bunch of my good friends over here. And they've heard me preach before. They've even gone to sleep on me preaching before. So <laughs> they're just so glad. I couldn't have said it better than Brother Jordan said about Sarah. The lady in the limelight in the founding of the nation of Israel. What do we see about him? Genesis chapter 17, as we look at verse 15, we see, God said to Abraham, as for your wife, Sarai, do not call her Sarai, for Sarah will be her name. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell to the ground, laughed, and thought in his heart, can a child be born to a hundred-year-old man? Can Sarah, a ninety-year-old woman, give birth? So Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael could live in your presence. But God said, No, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you'll name him Isaac. I will confirm my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you we thank you for an inerrant, infallible Bible. We thank you that our hearts can be exalted and exhorted and lifted up and edified by the truth of your scriptures. Lord, there's some powerful truth with Sarah's life. I pray that you would just calm my heart. I pray that there'd be no desire for self, flesh, or pride, but may only Jesus be exalted in our midst. For it's in Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Years ago, I had the privilege of making friends with a former Secret Service agent who had guarded several presidents. Now, I don't mean to be a name drop or anything, but it was fun to talk to him. I'd Tell me what it was like to be with Kennedy. Tell me about when you were with Johnson. What happened when you covered Nixon? And he'd tell me all about the stories. This, he began to operate. He was a man who had learned to operate on a first name basis with presidents, vice presidents, cabinet members, and leaders in Congress. My friend, and this is the truth, he even lived in Lee Harvey Oswald's home for two weeks after the Kennedy assassination. The veterans had guarded and socialized with national leaders spanning almost two decades. Upon retirement, my friend was able to go and speak to groups and civic groups and even churches on occasion. If he had not passed away, he'd be a good fellow to come to a men's meeting sometime and tell you his story. He was just such an interesting man. But one day he was in an elementary school. And all of a sudden, a young boy arose and said, Hey, is it true? And began to repeat a salacious rumor on one of our presidents. My friend stepped forward and said, Absolutely not. Nothing like that ever happened. And I was with him all the time. Later, I got him off. I said, uh, Gary, did that not happen? He said, yeah, it happened all the time. <laughs> I said, we used to bring her in and make sure everybody left them alone. It was terrible. I said, well, then why did you do that? He says, because I'll tell you, I don't want children growing up disrespecting our country's leaders. Now, right or wrong, I'm not here trying to pass on the ethics of what he did. But I think it's interesting that he said, he never wanted to hold up to ridicule a man who was a hero to so many people. 
Well, tonight we're talking about Sarah, likely the most admired lady in the New Testament. Actually, I think Brother Jordan said it better than I did. The lady in the limelight of the Old Testament, the founding of Israel. The very origin of the nation Israel came due to a divine promise. And the mother of that promise was Sarah. Every follower of God in Israel revered Sarah. But an honest look at Sarah's character displays some obvious flaws. Nonetheless, you go over to the New Testament, to the book of Galatians, and she's given as the mother of promise and the woman who fulfills the picture of grace. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, we find Abraham taking Sarai as his bride. Well, when God called out Abraham, Sarah was in the call as well. The promise was given to Abraham that his seed would bless the world. And there was a dual promise that those who would bless Abraham's seed would indeed be blessed of God. So Sarah holds a great place of importance as the mother of Israel. Sarah's story is used in Romans and in Galatians to explain the marvel of God's grace. Consider with me three episodes in Sarah's life and learn from that concerning our own experience. First episode I want to bring to you is when God changed her name. When God changed her name, there is a picture of destiny. For 90 years, Sarah's name was Sarai. Back in Genesis 12, God had given Abraham a promise of a great nation from come forth from his loins. Sarai was the wife of the man to whom the promise was given. And again, chapters reveal that God planned for Sarai to be the mother of nations. But in Genesis 12, Sarah was seen to be the daughter, and I know I'm using them interchangeably, the daughter of Haran and Milcah, the queen. Sarah I, and Abram were both children of Haran, and thus Sarai was Abraham's half-sister. Now I'm going to tell you, this past weekend, I was talking to one of our brothers here about, about uh, speaking to a family reunion. I, I'm sorry, I guess I'm old, but I love going to family reunions. And I'll tell you what else. If you'll give me 15 minutes, I'll find out I'm kin to you. Isn't that right, Ken? I mean, I'll find out kin with you somehow. My daughter, who's on Channel 13, even said on television, my dad thinks he's kin to everybody. Bill, I am not kin to you. I have tried my best to get with your dad and figure out a connection, but there's no kin. I'm chasing a rabbit here. But at that family reunion, I was asked to speak on a certain branch of our family. And when I did, I mentioned to my Uncle Tom and his wife, Murdy, and what wonderful, godly people they were. But then I said, you know, they were first cousins. And people looked at me, and some of the younger people began to laugh. I said, look, that's nothing I want to tell, but it's still the truth. They were first cousins. They were dignified, educated people involved in the community, leaders in their church, but nonetheless, they were first cousins. Now, if you want to talk about my Aunt Murdy and her husband, Tom, T.W. Killian, known as Tightwad Killian, I will tell you there's somebody even more specific you can talk about. Abraham was married to his half-sister. But as the daughter of Milcah, Sarai was princess. Therefore, her name meant my princess. This past Passover, my wife and I were invited to experience Passover in a Jewish home. The man of the house called his wife princess. My wife thought, wasn't that nice? Her name is princess. And she said something to her and said, princess, can we come over this way? And all of a sudden, the lady had a stern look on her face and said, my name is Ginger. In other words, her husband could call her princess, but no one else could. That was a pet name reserved only for the man of the house. Well, even so, Sarai was named my princess. But God changed her name from Sarai ever so slightly to Sarah, which brought a broader meaning of princess. Sarai was Abraham's princess. But now her name was Sarah, which fits the promise that she would be the princess over nations. God gave Sarah her name to designate that Sarah would be princess over nations. Learn some lessons about destiny, if you would. God called her out at age 90 and said, here's your destiny. What was her destiny? Realize this, that destiny may not be realized until late in life. Sarah was 90 years old 
before her destiny was set before. Granted, God had this plan from before birth and had arranged the events of her life up to until that point. But Sarah was well past the age of starting a great project like a family. I hear people all the time, yeah, we'd like to have more kids, but you know, we're past 30. I'm saying, past 30? You can go older than that. Well, I know, but once you get past 40, past 40, nothing. Sarah was 90 years old, and God gave her a promise of another child. Now, here's the mission of a child. Listen, learn this. As long as you're alive, you still have a destiny to fulfill. God didn't put you up on the shelf and say, all right, they taught Sunday school for years, they came to church at Central, they would sing, they were good to folks, they ministered to people, but 65 now, we're going to put them on the shelf. We can wave at them once a year and they're over. No, no, no. Until the day you die, God has a destiny for you. Think about that. Moses was 80 when he left Israel. What about the limits of age? Believe me, I'm familiar with the limits of age. I hang around somebody like Bill Sullivan, who he told me the other day, yeah, I know what it is, I'm getting old too. Really, how old are you, Bill? I turned 40. You turn 40 and you think you're old? <laughs> Try my age and I'm not gonna tell. You I'm, You guess it after church, I'll tell you if you're right. But friend, Sarah had limits that God overcame in her life. If you're still on this earth, God has something of eternal value for you. As a preacher in churches, many times I've gone to visit people, and sometimes I'll go visit people who are homebound and not in a good situation. And my experience is that oftentimes people get older and they say, I can't get out, I can't go anywhere, I just don't see why I'm still here on this earth. Let me tell you, seek the Lord in that matter. It may be that God's left you here for your power and prayer. It may be here because you can encourage people through telephone or through cards, but God still has a destiny for you to reach out and touch somebody in your family or somewhere in your life. God still has a destiny for you, even if, like Sarah, you were 90 years old. But there's a second truth here about destiny, and that's that destiny doesn't end when you leave this earth. Sarah had a destiny that's still making a difference thousands of years later. Sarah's testimony continues today and touches lives that will last throughout eternity. Consider that scripture tells us of a coming judgment seat of Christ for rewards. Does that happen when you die? Afraid not. This is a judgment that's coming in the future for each of us. Why not immediately? Because the works that you do live after you. Your kindnesses, your encouragement, your teaching, your personal acts of love will have effect on people even after your death. I could go around this room and point out people who have been such a blessing to me. I could point out people who just quietly serve God and make a difference. And you're here in this room tonight. And you say, yeah, but I'm, I'm nobody. Let me tell you something. If you were to pass from this earth, your effect doesn't leave right then. It still blesses us in years to come. It still challenges people. It still motivates people for years after you're gone. Your works live after you. Your kindnesses, your encouragement, your teaching, your personal acts of love with effect and bring a difference. Your positive efforts are accumulating and God uses your effort even after you're gone. Just focus on this truth. Your life is not lived in an island. You're not lived to be alone and without impact. Your life will touch lives and have impact far beyond where you live and how long you work. Your life lasts forever in the impact that you've made on this world. Grandparents, your influence on generations will live long after you're here on this earth. Sunday school teachers, your teaching. You know, I think about Sunday school teachers who taught me when I was just a young boy. I can't say little boy, I never was little. <laughs> What are you laughing at? <laughs> I was a young boy, six years old. I didn't weigh but 250 pounds. <laughs> I can remember Sunday school teachers, and sad to say, I couldn't tell you their name, but I remember the Bible teaching they gave me. And you know what? Their ministry lives on and on and on long after they're gone. Your destiny doesn't end when you pass from this life. 
So there's the first matter that we learn. God changed Sarah's life, and that set her destiny. And we have a destiny. Every person in this room has a destiny. There's a gift you have. There's a ministry you have. There's a challenge you have. And you're here for a reason to make a difference throughout eternity. But let's learn a second lesson about Sarah's life. God sent messengers that Sarah would have a baby in old age. And you know what? Her imperfect faith reflects her own assistance. In the situation of Genesis 18, the Lord appeared with three angels to clarify the Lord's promise to Abraham and Sarah. Verse 10 simply explains, And lo, Sarah, your wife, shall bear a son. Now, you say that's commonplace. People have babies every day. Yes, but Sarah was now over 90 years old. And here she is informed that she's going to have a baby. I've preached on this passage many times through the years. And when I was at one church every Sunday, I would just have fun. I would call out some 80-year-old lady and I'd say, in front of everybody, no, I have no discretion. And I said, you realize, what if we heard that you were going to have a baby next week? And all of a sudden she'd laugh and people around her would laugh. Well, I want you to picture that this really happened to Sarah. 90 years old. And the angel of the Lord and then three other angels came to tell her, you're going to have a baby. Now, unless you think this is impossible, please consider that God restored the youth of Abraham and Sarah. So even amidst young and old age, I believe from the context of Genesis, she looked young. But here was Sarah receiving a divine prophecy that she was to conceive and bear a son. Did she rejoice? Did she give dance for joy? Did Sarah give praise to God? No, Sarah laughed. You say, oh, I'm sure it was a laughter of happiness. No, the Lord exposed her laughing because Sarah denied laughing. The Lord confronted and confirmed that Sarah had indeed mocked God by her laughter. What does scripture tell us about Sarah's faith? All right, let's examine Sarah's faith. First, she laughed in disdain at the promise of God. She was certainly not rock solid in her faith, but God still used her, and God still blessed her as he taught her and fulfilled that promise. In Acts chapter 12, Peter was in prison for his preaching. And what did the church at Antioch do? I mean, what would you imagine? If God forbid we were to go through, go through persecution in our land, and you gathered at church for a special meeting, and somebody got with the sad news, they have imprisoned Brother Jordan for preaching the word of God. He's in prison, he's in jail right now. And somebody said, let's just pray that he could go home. And so that's exactly what happened with Peter. And they begin to pray. And I can just hear them praying. Now, I don't know what kind of prayer meetings take place at Central. I know a little bit about what prayer meetings take place at Bethel, but I know the kind I've been involved in. Somebody got round up and really prayed. Oh, Lord, I just know you're going to release Peter. Lord, shake open those jail doors. I, I pray that those doors just shake open, dear Lord. And they were just really giving it at it and prayed and prayed and prayed. And a few minutes later, a girl named Rhoda went to the front door and she saw it was Peter. She went back in there and said, look, Peter's at the front door. Now, what had they been praying for? For Peter to be released. And what happened? Peter was released and at their front door. Did they praise God? They said, you're crazy, woman. You're seeing a ghost. Oh, Lord, we just know you're going to release Peter. <laughs> Do you see that? They didn't really believe, did they? Now, I can hear somebody now. Boy, if you pray, you have to really believe. Listen, Jesus said we have to have the prayer of a grain of mustard seed. That's pretty tiny. God heard this prayer even when their faith was far from certain. Someone came by our office one day and left. I wasn't there and left thousands of gospel tracts. I said, well, that's good. I'm sure we could use them. People who give out gospel tracts. That's a good way to witness. And I thought it's fine. But I started reading them, and it said, you may have sought to know the Lord, but you have to just really, really, really believe. And I wasn't using those words. It was talking about how rock solid you have to believe. 
And I just started thinking, I wonder how many Christians live in fear. Did I believe hard enough? What if I wonder sometimes? What if I repented? Did I really repent enough? Lord, did I really, really believe this or did I just sort of wonder a little bit? Remember the request of the man to whom Jesus exhorted to believe. He gave a response that I sometimes echo in my own heart. He prayed. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You ever been there before? Now look, my wife has never had a question in her mind. God bless her. And I don't, I'm not criticizing her. I'm, I'm praising the work the Lord's done in her heart. But me, I'm going to be honest with you. I wonder about things sometimes. I wonder. Sometimes I'm a person of doubt. Sometimes I'm a question of question. I was in a department store one time and I was thinking about my doubts. And I was walking as we rode up the escalator. When I get on those escalators, Austin, they slow down for some reason. I'm just giving you ammunition, that's all. But I was riding the escalator and then I thought, now I could step either direction when I get off this escalator. Sometimes I wonder about matters, but can I tell you something? What you have to do is step in the direction of faith and say, Lord, I believe, even amidst my unbelief. Ian Thomason told, Thomas told of making plans to leave his home in the east, to go on a preaching mission out in California. He was getting ready to go. He was packing up his car, and he was getting everything ready. And his neighbor came out and looked around. He said, uh, where are you going, Thomas? He said, I'm going out west to preach. How long are you going to be gone? Oh, I'll be gone. Probably two months. He said, you're going in that car? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm taking that car. And so the man started pushing up and down to see what the shocks would do. He began to kick the tires. And finally, he opened the hood and began to look inside. He said, you think this car is going to get you to California and back? And Brother Thomas said, I, I sure do. He said, man, you have great faith. And Ian Thomas said, no, I have a great car. The guy looked at him. A minute later, Thomas's wife came out and said, hey, man, you have a pretty wife. He said, yes, sir, thank you. He said, you're going to leave her here for two months while you go to California? Leave her here all by yourself? You trust her that much? And Thomas said, yes, I sure do. He said, hey, you have a lot of faith. To which Thomas said, no, I have a great wife. Hear me. My faith is often weak. Yet I am trusting the Lord Jesus Christ who died on Calvary's cross and rose victoriously the third day. In Jesus is my hope for everlasting life. You said, man, you have great faith. No, no, I have weak faith. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. But I certainly have a great Savior. My hope is not in how much I believe. My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's a perfect Savior. He is God in the flesh. He is the one who bore our sins. He is the one who conquered death for us. I want you to learn a third truth about Sarah. Notice that in spite of Sarah's wrong, God has proclaimed her as a picture of grace. Consider what we see coming from Sarah's life. She laughed in scorn at the promise of God. Sarah joined with Abraham to deceive Abimelech when Abraham felt threatened. In Genesis chapter 20, they walked in and Abraham looked over the scene and said, this is a powerful king and you're a beautiful woman. You said, wait, she was in her 90s. Was she beautiful? God had restored her youth. She was beautiful all over again. And he said, look, you know, we're married, but we're also half brother and sister. So if they ask me, I'll just tell him you're my sister because that way if he takes you as his own, he won't kill us. Well, we know what happened and how God allowed Abraham to tell that deceiving point, which wasn't a complete lie, but it was sure deception. And sure enough, Sarah went along with it as well. We also see how Sarah mistreated Agar. First of all, Sarah didn't believe God to give her a son. So she had her handmaiden, Hagar, conceive with Abraham and intending to count this child as the promised child to live before him. 
Thus, when the baby of Abraham and Hagar mocked the baby Isaac, who was later born, Sarah was bitter. And Sarah ordered that they would cast out the bondwoman, as Galatians says. And we're going to throw Hagar out. Her baby's laughing at my baby. And my baby is the baby of promise. Say what you want, but I have good reason to be down on Sarah at this point. But the very woman, the mother of promise, Sarah's wife of Abraham, is the woman held as an example of God's grace. Yes, Sarah did wrong. Yes, Sarah laughed in faith. Yes, she sorely mistreated Hagar, running her out after Hagar only did what Sarah told her to do. But in Galatians 4, we find the promise that believers in Christ are sons of Sarah. In Romans 9, we find where Sarah is the picture of God's gracious promise to New Testament believers. Here is the glorious truth that someone who has sinned has lied and deceived and who has an imperfect faith. That same person is a picture of God's grace. You may be here today and say, man, I've messed up in life. So did Sarah but she's still a picture of God's grace. The chap last chapter in our life as believers is not going to be failure, but it's going to be that which God has done in us and more importantly for us. Aren't you glad that the final word for the child of God is not our sin, but His glory in our behalf? KC and Christy Jackson, I'm calling their names, I contacted KC today and said, I'm going to talk about you in church tonight. He said, that's okay. They're dear friends of mine. KC's having some physical problems right now. He's married to a girl named Christy, and they're just a ball of fun. They are fun. And as I talk about them, I think about what a serious yet overwhelming blessing life they've had. Christy was raised in a terrible home. Her father left when she was born, and her mother immediately married a cruel, rough man. This man was abusive to Christy and to her little brother. And when Christy was two years old, he beat her to the point that she just about died. But worse than that, he killed her little brother. That went on for a short time, and he was arrested and went to prison. Christy trusted Christ as her Savior, and as a believer in Christ, she still couldn't help it. She hated the man. You say, well, that's wrong. Well, we're not arguing that. But she still struggled with hating the man. Every time he'd come up for parole, he was sentenced to life without life with parole. And so she would go and object to his release every time it came up. And then finally, one day she just said, I want to walk with God. I want to know his presence. I want to be right. And so one day she just loaded up, made an appointment at the prison, and went to see her stepfather who had beat her within an inch of her life and who had actually killed her little brother. And she looked at him and said, God has dealt with me. I want you to know I forgive you. And the man began to weep. He says, well, I want you to know that I've accepted Christ as my Savior and I know I'm saved. She went home and said, he thinks if he tells me that, then I won't object at the next parole hearing. I'll still object. And she did. May I say probably rightly so. But she would still get a message from him occasionally. He'd say, I love the Lord. I know I can never make up for what I did with you, but I love the Lord. Well, one day she had the message that he died. Christy is a NICU nurse. And a lady that would work in their hospital also spent time working in the prison where this man spent the years of his life. And one day she didn't tell the man, the con tell the woman the connection, but Christy said, did you know this certain prisoner? She said, oh, yes, I knew him. She said, I never knew a more godly prisoner in my life. I never knew a man that was a picture of the grace of God any more than this man. This man led numbers of prisoners to Christ. This man had Bible studies, and he was a great Christian witness. And she looked and she said to herself, but he killed my brother. And then she began to realize that the grace of God is more powerful than any sin we could commit. There's an old hymn that said, his blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail for me. 
You know, I love that some of you are involved in the recovery ministry in town. I, I wouldn't be worth a flip at it, but let me tell you, I praise God for you. I thank God for people that can deal with people in hard times who have had difficulties. And I'm here to tell you, regardless of what's on your past, our God has forgiven us and cleansed us. What about Sarah? She's a picture of the grace of God. And what about you and me? If you know Christ is your Savior, your sins are paid for, they're gone, they're never to be seen again. And one day, when you see Jesus, just like the man in prison who died, we'll walk into his very presence and we'll be in the righteousness of Christ. And for that, we praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace. And Lord, I just pray for all of God's people here that they'd find encouragement in the truth of the grace of God. Thank you for Brother Jordan and his wonderful ministry here. Thank you for his precious wife. I just pray you'd honor your name through this wonderful church. In Jesus' name we pray.